Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're just going to give it another five to ten minutes so that we get uh, more people that registered uh, to sign in, um, and then we'll start roughly about uh, 35 past.
I can't think uh, enough of the attendees um, have signed in, so we can start. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for part two of the series on large motors and drive systems presented by Kirk Moss of WEG. Um, just like to remind all of the attendees uh, to ensure the volume is turned up on your device, ensure you have a stable internet connection um, to ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Um, also, there is a questions panel um, and all the attendees are uh, encouraged to ask questions via this control panel. Um, by default, it's con uh, located on the right hand side of your screen. The chat function is unfortunately reserved for web organizers and panelists to communicate with the attendees, and the attendees will be able to chat, uh, will not be able to chat with each other. However, you guys are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SAE YouTube channel, SAE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SAE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. The page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more uploads. Furthermore, a certificate of attendance will be issued um, by tomorrow for this webinar, uh, so you can claim your um, CBD points from EXA. My name is uh, Theodore Fisser. Um, so Apologize. Um, sorry for that. My name is Theodore Fisser. Um, I'm the vice chair for the SAE Mpumalanga Center. Um, I'm an electrical engineer for Braconics Funda. Our presenter today is Kirk Moss. Um, those of you who joined us last week uh, will be familiar with him. Uh, Kirk has a diploma in electrical engineering and has more than 12 years experience in the field of medium voltage drive systems. And Kirk is presently the engineering of projects senior manager at Zest Wake's automation division, formerly known as Shore Controls. Um, with that, Kirk, um, I'd like to hand over to you. Great, thank you very much, Theo. Appreciate that. Right. All right, so just to go through the content of what we intend to cover today, we will spend some time. We're going to all of these items in their, in their own right, we could spend a day discussing. So we take a fairly broad strokes, high level approach to each of these subjects. Each of these can be discussed in additional detail um, in other, other presentations. But uh, we start with input harmonics. We specifically look are looking at diode rectifiers, which are typical of VSDs, and how they create how they create harmonics. We then examine multi-pulse diode rectifiers with the use of phase shifting, um, which is commonly used to reduce harmonics on large um, medium voltage variable speed drives. We then look at output harmonics, and uh, we cover a little bit on the VSD switching techniques. We will then look at um, three topologies. So there's many topologies on, on high power, medium voltage or, or um, large variable speed drives, but we will focus on three of them. These are three common topologies um, available in the market. The first is the NPC three level topology. The second is the cascaded H bridge multi-level inverter. And the last would be a hybrid that is a combination of the NPC and an H bridge. Um, we'll discuss those three in some detail and then we'll look at some special applications just for interest uh, an application uh, for frozen charge protection mill applications right so let's start harmonics the creation of harmonics using a six pulse rectifier and, and then mitigating these harmonics using multi-pulse transformers so um what we're showing here is a phase to phase voltage for a single cycle period. So you'll notice on the x axis we have a time scale from 0 to 0 0.02 seconds. That is the time it takes for one complete cycle in a 50 hertz system. 
in that cycle, you have six possible voltage, uh, phase to phase voltage scenarios, and they are shown up above there. So you have AB, and you would have the negative of, of that or the opposite polarity of that, which would be BA. You then have AC, the negative polarity of that would be CA, and you have BC and the negative polarity of that, which would be CB. Okay, then if we throw a six pulse bridge rectifier into this scenario, we have that phase to phase relationship from our supply. And what happens? When your phase AB is that when that phase to phase voltage is higher than any of your other phase to phase voltages, the diodes one and diode six will conduct. So if we just follow that circuit, we conduct from phase A through diode one, through the load, which we'll talk about now, the, the voltage waveform that we, that we start with is would actually consider a purely resistive load. Here. We're showing a capacitor because that's where we're going to, to, to get to in our explanation. But to start with, this would be considered a resistive load. So we conduct through diode one, through the load, and back through diode six on B phase. So that's our AB conduction. Then when AC takes over as the highest phase to phase voltage, we are still in phase A. So diode one continues to conduct, but now our return path is through um, phase C. So that would be diode two that now conducts. So we have a switch over from diode six to diode two, diode one is still conducting. Notably, our peak to peak phase angle is 60 degrees between the peaks of these two pulses. If we carry on, we get to phase to phase voltage BC higher than the other phase to phase voltages. So our, our diode conduction is from phase B through diode 3 and back through diode 2 on phase C. And so we can complete the cycle in a similar manner. So what's interesting to note here is that for the period of one cycle, you have six pulses that are the let through voltage to your DC link. So on the output of your bridge rectifier, if this was a purely resistive load, at the moment it's showing a capacitor, if this was a purely resistive load, that green six pulse rippled waveform would be your D, what your DC link voltage would look like. Okay. But we don't have a resistive load. In a variable speed drive, we, we use a, capa a capacitor that resists an instantaneous change in voltage. And so the, the fall off of this voltage is delayed. Okay, so the capacitor actually holds some holds charge, um, and that delays the drop of of, uh, of our, our DC of our DC link. So in essence, what it does is it reduces the overall ripple of that DC link voltage, and we have something that looks a little bit more like the black curve. Okay. What's interesting to note is I've put two crosses there. From let me just go go back a bit. When, um, when we are, when our phase to phase voltage, which is between those two crosses, is higher than my capacitor voltage, then my volt, my, my, uh, my supply is, is providing the energy. However, when I move to this uh, interval, my capacitor voltage is higher than my phase to phase voltage. During this period of time, the energy required from my load, which would, could be a motor on the output of my VSD or whatever, that is drawing its energy no longer from the, from the supply. The supply voltage is lower than the capacity, capacitor voltage. Energy is drawn from the capacitor in that interval. Just to demonstrate, okay, so sorry, let me just go back here. So what we've shown here is what the voltage waveform 
on the DC link at the output of the bridge rectifier will look like. What we're now going to do is, is have a look at what the current waveform, if we were to measure the current um, in one phase, in this case, we are looking at phase A, what would that current waveform look like? Okay, well, let's have a look. So we've said that during the period where the phase to phase voltage is higher than the capacitor voltage, my energy, in this case, in the form of current, is drawn from my supply. That's why during that interval shown in the red, if I measure my current in phase A, I get a peak and it drops off. The reason it drops off is that during this interval shown in orange, my load, which could be a motor on the output of my VSD, it's not shown in the drawing, we're just showing up to the capacitor. But imagine I've got this, this VSD is connected to a motor, my motor needs to draw, draw current. During this interval, it is now drawing its current not from phase A from the supply, but in fact from the capacitor. And that's why if I'm examining my current at the input, I have no current drawn, drawn during that interval. Then when my capacitor voltage drops and my phase to phase voltage again exceeds my capacitor voltage, I'm drawing energy from the supply. And so I get another spike, another peak. And so I, uh, I keep going. So then I enter another, another interval where my capacitor voltage is higher. And so I'm drawing current from the capacitor, not from the supply. The same ha happens on my negative phase sequence. BA, uh, but I'm now drawing current with negative polarity when phase to phase voltage is higher than my capacitor voltage. And then in the, in the interval where the capacitor voltage exceeds the phase to phase voltage, exactly the same, I no longer am drawing current from my supply. So the end result of that is this very funny looking waveform. Instead of drawing a nice sinusoidal waveform, like a motor directly connected to the line would do, I draw these funny bunny ear type uh, waveform shapes from the supply. And that is uh, a distorted waveform. And that will lead us into our discussion on harmonics. Um, but just one interesting thing to note, my capacitor interval, the interval during which my capacitor supplies the energy is not always the same, even for the same VSD. It is a factor that is determined by the load. By the load, I mean the, the electric motor. So when the, when the motor is drawing a very light load, my capacitor voltage is very high and drops off slowly. So it, it stays at a very high level. So my motor spends more of its time drawing energy from the capacitor than it does from the supply. Conversely, when my load is very heavy on my motor, when I'm operating in a full load condition, I draw the energy from the capacitor down much more rapidly. And so it reduces the amount of time that I'm drawing energy from the capacitor and increases the amount of time I'm drawing energy from the, from the supply. Just to demonstrate that visually, this is an example. So you can see here my capacitor drawdown on a heavy load situation is much greater. And so you can see, I no longer have two separate peaks. I now have a more continuous voltage waveform uh, under a heavy load condition. Let me compare that to the low load condition. My current amplitude has increased, obviously, because I'm saying that my load on my motor has increased. But in addition to that, the actual waveform shape drawn from the supply has improved. My distortion is, is, is lower, is less. Okay, now we just, we're going to introduce the concept of multi-pulse diode rectifiers and using phase shift techniques to reduce the harmonics. So we've discussed already the six pulse bridge rectifier, which is shown there. The voltage uh, waveform measured at the DC link, we've already discussed how we get that rippled waveform. 
but that is, that is what it would look like. I can then put another six pulse rectifier, either in series or in parallel with the first one. And that will have a similar waveform. I've represented it in blue. However, because I have a phase shift between my delta and my star, I have a natural 30 degree phase angle difference between the windings of these two transformers. I essentially shift the uh, waveform, the DC link voltage waveform, the six pulse waveform, I shift it by 30 degrees with reference to the other one. I now end up with a case where previously on a normal six pulse rectifier, I had a 60 degree phase angle between my peaks. I now get a 30 degree phase angle between my two peaks. And the net result of that is I have a, in the same single cycle period, instead of only now having six pulses, I now introduce an additional six. And so I have now 12 pulses of DC link ripple for this configuration as opposed to six. Okay, that was the, we've looked at the voltage. So again, we're going to break down what happens with the current on the input. If we were to measure the current on the input of one phase of the first rectifier, it is what is represented in blue. I've just kept the voltage, the six pulse voltage waveform up there for reference, but the current waveform would look like what is in blue. So you can note the similarity of that waveform, current waveform, to what we already showed for a standard six pulse rectifier. And then the same occurs with the other, with rectifier number two, shown in green. I have a similar bunny ears distorted waveform measured in one current. These are, these are connected to the same supply system by the primary. And so essentially at the input of this transformer primary, I superimpose these two waveforms on top of each other. So they are summed, they are added together. And my net result of that is the waveform that you see there. I'll, I'll clear the screen so you can see it a little bit more clearly. But essentially, if I'm now measuring the current in a single phase on the primary side of the transformer, I'm getting what looks like a much less distorted waveform, a much more sinusoidal looking um, shape than what I was getting on just a one six pulse rectifier with no phase shifting techniques. And that shows it there. So this phase shift technique is, a, is commonly used in medium voltage drives, not so much in low voltage drives because generally the, comp the total megawatt installed base of medium voltage drives is always going to be large. So we, um, you, you're never going to put in a, a 55 kilowatt medium voltage drive. It's always going to be a couple of megawatts. So the designer of the medium voltage drive system already or needs to take cognizance of harmonics right from the get-go, because it's pretty much guaranteed that if you don't, you're going to have an issue with the um, with harmonics on your system. So this showed a 12 pulse system. A 12 pulse system has 12 voltage uh, rip, uh, pulses in the, in the DC link voltage ripple and 30 degree angle, but from peak to peak. But we can in introduce additional rectifiers. We can continue adding six pulse rectifiers either in series or in parallel. Uh, and we can adjust their phase angles to increase the number of pulses. So if we take the simple case, 360 degree single cycle divided by six pulses gives me my 60 degree angle peak to peak that we've already discussed. Um, my phase shift here, there is no phase shift. So my, I, I say six pulse times one 
is equal to six pulse. The minimum number of secondaries I need on a transformer, well, I don't need any, I, I need only one. If I go to the 12 pulse scenario, 360 degrees divided by 12 is equal to 30 degrees. Um, I now have a 30 degree peak to peak phase angle. Um, I need two at least two six pulse rectifiers as we've already seen to give me my 12 pulses that means i need at least two secondaries on my phase shifting transformer or any multiple of two so i can have four secondary windings for example on a 12 pulse rectifier my rectifier will have four six pulse bridge rectifiers and um, my transformer can have four secondaries I just have two secondaries that are the same phase angle as the other two secondaries. So that's why we talk about the minimum number of secondaries, but I can increase that to any multiple of two and still have a 12 pulse system. If we look at 18 pulse, 316 degrees divided by 18 means I need a 20 degree angle between my, between my peaks, which means my phase shift needs to be 20 degrees. And I need at least three bridge rectifiers to give me my 18 pulse solution. And likewise, I need at least three secondary windings in my transformer or any multiple of three. Then a 24 pulse system, 360 degrees divided by 24 pulse means I need a 15 degree uh, phase shift. Peak to peak, I need at least four bridge rectifiers to give me the, that's the minimum requirement for 24 pulse but I can increase that to any multiple of four. And so I can, I can carry on and increase to 30 pole, 36 pole. We can keep going. Um, we can go right up to 72 poles, which is uh, practical in some cases. Okay, then just to introduce a few other ways to do it. So the the standard six pulse diode rectifier we've already mentioned needs only one secondary winding um, to, to supply it from a 12 pulse scenario. So I mentioned that we need at least two secondary windings, which is shown in the first diagram. But there's a few ways I can achieve it. I can have a single primary and four secondary windings. Um, or I could have two separate transformers, each with its own primary and secondary. So you can see here we have a star to star and a delta to star. That's another way to do to do 12 pulse uh, phase shifting. Um, and this just shows a 24 pulse configuration in its simplest form. Um, I need four secondary windings. I can we have some flexibility. We can change this. We can put multiples of four. I can also do one single primary and four secondaries on one transformer, or I can split it into two transformers as shown. All right, so we've shown some distorted waveforms. Now we, um, as engineers, we want to analyze those waveforms and be able to compare them to something. So the way we do that is by breaking up a distorted waveform into a series of harmonics. And so in this diagram, you can see our final waveform is quite distorted and it's very difficult to make sense of this waveform or to compare it to some standard or compare it to other waveforms for that matter. So what we do through Fourier analysis is we break this waveform up into a fundamental sine wave and then a series of, uh, of, of harmonic integers added to that fundamental, which ultimately will give me this distorted waveform. Uh, so we can vary the amplitude of each of these harmonics in order to change what the distorted waveform looks like. Just to show you, there's a few ways we can represent a distorted waveform um, and harmonics. The most rudimentary way is to display graphically the, um, 
on, on the time domain or frequency domain, the actual distorted waveform itself. We can break that distorted waveform up into its fundamental plus a series of harmonic frequencies which add together to create that distorted waveform. This becomes a lot easier for analysis and comparison. And we can go one step further and represent it in the frequency domain. So, for example, if we look at this distorted waveform, we, we would divide it, let's say, for example, the fifth harmonic, we show its amplitude is 20%. That means that the, the, uh, the harmonic frequency that is five times the frequency of the fundamental. So let's say, for example, this fundamental frequency is 50 hertz. Then the fifth harmonic would be the waveform that is at 250 hertz. Basically, it crosses the zero midline five times on every um, on every cycle of the fundamental wave. And we can represent that in the frequency domain as shown. All right, so looking at the formula for THD, what we do is we find the root means the root mean square of each in, of the square of each individual harmonic starting from the second order harmonic. In other words, we ignore the fundamental and we square each of those of those harmonic contributors um, and we add them together and then we divide it by the fundamental by the amplitude of the fundamental and that gives us THD as a percentage, um, and that allows us to analyze and compare and uh, restrict by standard, etc. So let's look at an example. This this is the harmonic breakdown for a square wave. So what we can see here is that our second harmonic is uh, twenty. Uh, this could be our third harmonic, which is fourteen point three. Uh, fourth harmonic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We we square each of those harmonic contributors, add them together, and square root them. We divide them by the fundamental. In this case, because we're working on percentage, that is simply a hundred, and that gives us a THD of twenty nine percent. So that is the total harmonic distortion for a square wave. All right, let's try to make this a little more practical. What does THDI mean uh, for a plant designer? Well, that distorted current has an effect on certain equipment, for example, transformers. Transformers need to provide some additional current that does not do any work. It is simply uh, used up by the harmonics of the distorted waveform. To look at the, an example using that same square, square wave example that we showed previously, Let's take an example where our fundamental current is 100 amps. That would be the sinusoidal requirement for this uh, transformer or this load. But I have a distorted waveform and it, is, uh, it has a total harmonic distortion of 29%. In this case, because my fundamental is 100, I can say that, is, that represents 29 amps out of the 100 amps. But to find my my true THD, I need to do a root mean uh, square. And if I do 100 square plus 29 square square root, I get a, a total of 104 amps that needs to be supplied in this situation. Therefore, 4 amps extra is supplied by the transformer to this load, which performs no useful work. It is wasted current. So if that transformer is not dimensioned for that additional current, in this case, it's only four amps, but still, if it is not dimensioned to supply that additional four amps, the transformer could over, overheat or um, trip, give, give some nuisance trips. So there are some ways that we derate and design transformers. Um, United Laboratories from the US has a K-factor method and IEC has a slightly different method, they call it factor K. Um, those we're not going to go into too much detail, but they have slightly different ways of how they specify a user needs to deal with the transformer in the case of 
harmonics um, on, on, on the network. Here's a list of some of the standards. There's a lot of standards that talk about harmonics. They, they vary the, the requirement for harmonics depending on the type of equipment that is being used, depending on the type of plant, uh, whether it's a, a hospital, whether it's a, a, utili a, a utility, or whether it's a, a mine, um, can vary the, the requirement for harmonics or, or harmonic limitation. Um, and a whole lot of other factors. I'm not going to go into detail, but these are just a couple of the standards. The most common that I use on a day-to-day -day basis is this one here, the IEEE 519 standard, and this one here, the NRS 048 standard. Those, those two standards talk to more general plant scenarios like a, a mine, um, and are more applicable to our, to our applications. In those standards, again, depending on the standard, uh, whether it's an IEC standard or an IEEE standard, there's some definitions that have to be understood in order to correctly or adequately do a harmonic analysis. A couple of these definitions are shown there. So this is an important one, the point of common coupling. This needs to be defined between the, sp the specifier of the harmonic limit and the equipment supplier you're supplying equipment into the plant that could generate harmonics. Harmonic current does not tend to change through the impedance of the system, but the harmonic voltage does. The further up, the first, further, the, the closer you get to the utility point, the point of common coupling between your plant and the utility, the less the effect a harmonic current downstream will have on your total voltage. Okay, so the, defining the, where, this, where the harmonic limit um, must be applied to is quite important. Most harmonic standards tend to aim at the same thing. They want to reduce or eliminate the distortion on the voltage waveform um, oftentimes, in order to prevent that distorted voltage waveform from affecting other equipment or other customers, other plants, uh, next door, uh, a next door plant or some other users on the system, that is generally the main criteria that the standards try to achieve. So generally, they would stipulate a limit on the total harmonic distortion of the voltage and then again, I reiterate, it becomes very important to define exactly where that voltage distortion limit must be applied to, which point of common coupling must it be applied at. Um, and in general, that, that requirement is more relaxed the further downstream you get. All right, so let's let's look at some actual measured waveforms for for the different um, diode rectifiers that we were discussing earlier. So if you measure the current in one phase on the input of a six pulse rectifier, we've shown theoretically what it looks like. This is an actual measurement. It gives us a typical THDI, that's total harmonic distortion current of about 36%. That depends on a few things. That depends on if I'm putting in a, a an input reactor to reduce this. It also depends on the load. We saw earlier, the higher the load, the higher the the, the lower the total harmonic distortion as a percentage. We saw that the waveform got less distorted because it's drawing more of the current from the supply, less of the current from the capacitor. Okay, at low load um, scenarios my distortion as a percentage of my current is much higher. However, because my load is low, the actual absolute amplitude of that current is less. So it has a less effect on, the, on distorting the voltage. So for example, in this case, I'm showing that the THDI of a six pulse rectifier at full load is 36%. 
the amplitude of this current, of the distorted current, could be, let's say, for example, 50 amps. Okay. At reduced load, if I put low load on the motor that this, that this VSD is driving, my THDI percentage will increase to as much as, let's say, for example, 60%. However, because I'm at a low load condition, my absolute amplitude of distorted current would be less than the previous example, would be, and it could be as low as, say, 20 amps. So it actually has less, even though my THDI as a percentage is higher under that lower load condition, the actual effect that it has to distort my voltage is less. Just something to take into consideration. If I look at a 12 pulse bridge rectifier with phase shift transformer, my actual measured waveform is shown below. This is for a series connected um, rectifier, 12 pulse rectifier. Typical THDI in this case is between 9 and 12 percent at full at full load. Then I go to the 18 pulse scenario. I have a typical THDI of 4.5 to 6%. My waveform, my current waveform, is starting to look very smooth, very sinusoidal. However, I, yes, I'm benefiting from an improved sinusoidal waveform, but I'm adding complexity to my device. I've had to add, so in order to, in order to improve, from a THD of between 9 and 12, let, let's say, let's go in the middle, let's say to improve, improve on a THDI of 11%, or let's say 10%, to bring it down to 5%, I need to add at least one additional secondary winding into my transformer and one additional diode rectifier. Then I go to, I look at a 24 pulse, scenario here i've got to add at least one more secondary and one more bridge rectifier this would bring my thdi down to four percent what we are noticing is as we are adding complexity and increasing the number of harmonics i'm getting a diminishing return curve on my thdi performance let me represent that in the table so a standard six pulse drive with no reactors or chokes on the input and no DC link reactor would typically give me a THDI. These are all um, indicated at full load condition. This rectifier would give me more than 100% THDI. I can take that same drive, that same diode rectifier, and I can put a 2% reactor at the input of that device. And that will make a massive improvement and bring me down to 56%. I can increase the voltage drop of that reactor, or that choke at the input of the drive. And you can see again a, a very large benefit that will bring me down to the 30, that's 36, 37% mark that I, that I showed in the previous slides. Then if I introduce phase shift technique, I use a 12 pulse, I can I can get a dramatic improvement from 37% right down to between 10 and 12%. At 18 pulse, 4 to 6%, 24 pulse, 2 to 4%, 30 pulse, 1.5 to 2.5%. And I've just added a regenerative drive there just as a just to compare. If I don't use a phase shifting technique, but I use an active front end drive, I will get between 3 to 5%. What we can see is that uh, Improvement in harmonics as we increase the complexity of the number of pulses starts to wear thin after a certain point. Just to demonstrate that against one of the typical standards, um, IEEE 519, we did some experiments and some simulations. We took a plant scenario, we took a, a plant that's supplied by an 8 MVA uh, utility transformer. And we played around with the percentage of distorted loads on that 8 MVA transformer. So, for example, and then we compared it to the, the limits 
specified in IEEE 519. Just for the purpose of this presentation, the one that I'm going to concentrate is this first one, which is arguably the most important limit in that standard, and that is the total harmonic distortion of the voltage for a general system in IEEE 519. That is specified that this THDV for a general system at the point of common coupling between the customer or the plant and the utility, for example, ESCOM, that THDV must not exceed 5%. Right. So comparing um, six pulse drives, if we put on that ATMVA transformer, if we placed in, on, uh, in installation only six pulse VSDs, and we put of that 8 MVA load, if 13% of its load was supplying um, six pulse VSDs, we would easily meet the requirement for THDV with no additional harmonic mitigation, no, no, no harmonic filters, no, um, no phase shifting techniques. Uh, and the same can be said for increasing that load right up to 36%. Even if 36% of that 8 MVA utility transformer is loaded with 6 pulse VSDs, I still come in below the 5% limit um, of IEEE 519. If I start loading that 8 MVA transformer more than 36% with VSD loads, then I start to have an issue. Um, I, I do not meet the standard, and then I need to start investigating, in this case, some additional harmonic mitigation, either through a, uh, through a centralized harmonic filter or some other techniques. If I look at the same comparison, but I use, let's say, for example, 12 pulse medium voltage VSDs installed on that 18 VO transformer, even if 65, 7, 65%, 79%, as high as 92% of that utility transformer is loaded with 12 pulse MVVSDs, I still meet the requirements of THDV for IEEE 519. If I replace those 12 pulse VSDs with, let's say, for example, 18 pulse VSDs, then even in the unlikely scenario that my 8 MVA utility transformer is 100% loaded with that uh, VSD load, and then I still meet, uh, easily meet the requirement for IEEE 501. So I guess the takeaway point here is that if you can get away with the simplest case, which is a 12 pulse solution, go for it. If not, then start increasing the complexity as needed. All right, so we've discussed harmonics that's related to the input. Uh, the, the, the distortion of the waveform on the input of a drive system. Now we're going to look at the output waveform. So um, the output waveform of the VSD supplying the motor. So to start that conversation off, we're going to look at some different switching uh, methods to uh, to, to provide voltage to the motor from a, from a VSD. So one of the simplest uh, methods to switch um, the DC link voltage to the machine is using a sinusoidal reference and then a carrier waveform. So the sinusoidal, sinusoidal reference waveform is set to whatever frequency and amplitude you want to you want to provide to the motor. So if we look in this in the, in this first case on the top, we have let's say for example the VSD wants to supply 50 a 50 hertz voltage to the machine to the motor. So that means this one full cycle is completed in 0.02 seconds. I then, I then create a carrier signal that represents my switching frequency. Okay. So in this example, I have in one 50 hertz waveform, reference waveform, I have one 
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, I've got 12 carrier uh, frequency references. That, that means that the switching frequency of this VSD is 12 times by 50 because there's 12 switching that we're switching 12 times for every complete 50 hertz cycle that gives me a switching frequency of 600 hertz okay. um, another term that we want to define here is modulation index so when i supply 50 hertz to a machine i also want my voltage to be at its maximum why because a vsd increases voltage from zero to nominal lin in linear scale with the increase in speed so in other words if i supply let's say for example 6600 volt from the vsd to a machine at 50 hertz when the vsd supplies 25 hertz it also reduces the voltage amplitude to um, to 3.3 kV, half. Um, so, we, in other words, we have a linear relationship between the output voltage and the output frequency. So, just to get back to this term modulation index. So, when my output frequency, well, sorry, when my, when my sinusoidal waveform is at its nominal condition, in this case 50 hertz, my um, my carrier uh, frequency or my carrier signal amplitude can be the same because I want it to be maximum. So the, the, the ratio between the amplitude of the sinusoidal signal and the amplitude of the carrier signal, when that is at one, that is when I'm supplying maximum speed and maximum voltage to the motor, then my modulation index is one. When I reduce the output voltage to the motor um, and um, proportionally reduce the output frequency, so in the second case here, we can see that for one cycle, I'm only now doing half a waveform. So this is supplying 25 hertz to the motor. Because I'm only supplying 25 hertz, I decrease my sinusoidal waveform to half that of the carrier waveform so the, in this case my modulation index is said to be 0 0.5 another interesting thing to point out here between these two different waveforms the switching frequency in both these cases is exactly the same it's the same vsd that switching frequency is set to 600 hertz in this case in the when i'm supplying 50 hertz to to my motor my current waveform looks like the jagged line that's shown on the right. I have a fairly high degree of harmonic distortion at this full voltage, full frequency condition. When I decrease my frequency, because I'm operating at the same 600 hertz uh, switching frequency, I'm now, I now have all 12 carrier frequency signals intersecting half my waveform, as opposed to the above scenario where I had 12 carrier frequency signals intersecting my complete waveform. Because of that, I have more uh, pulses. I'm switching um, more times in a half cycle. And so theoretically, my harmonic distortion of my current waveform to the motor re uh, reduces. In other words, at lower speed, lower modulation index, and low frequency, I have a lower harmonic distortion on my output voltage waveform, uh, on my output current waveform to my motor. This is just a, another view of the same thing. In the top example, we have an, we are uh, we have an output power from the VSD of 50 kilowatts. 
at 10,000 RPM at using a 4 kilohertz switching frequency. We can see that the THDI is 12.69%. In the second case, all we are doing, we are keeping the switching frequency the same at 4 kilohertz, but we are doubling the speed, hence we are doubling the output power, but in this case our, our harmonic distortion, because we've increased the voltage and the modulation index, we have now seen an increase on the total amount of distortion current. And that's just to, to set some of the basic principles, which we'll get into in a little bit more detail later. All right, so this carrier-based frequency and, and reference sinusoidal signal is an old, outdated way to do um, output switching control of a BSD. There's much more modern techniques, for example, space vector modulation. So we will very briefly just describe how space vector modulation works. So if you consider a normal three-phase sinusoidal to supply to a motor, we can break that up into three, three vectors, or three phases, ABC or UVW. And we can sum those vectors. We can do a vector sum of those three vectors at any given time in space and create one single rotating vector to represent the motor three-phase voltage condition at any given time. All right, but now on a, on a VSD, we have RGBTs switching on the output. And they are switching a DC link that has a fairly constant magnitude or amplitude. It's a stiff DC link voltage. Um, and so we, we have um, some options to try to create this single rotating vector at any point in time. We need to switch in, in combinations um, of vectors using the VSD. So just to establish how many switching combinations are possible from a standard low voltage VSD with six RGBTs in the inverter section. Well, we have two switches and we have three legs. So simple mathematics means that we go two to the power of three. That gives us eight possible switching vectors that we can achieve from this um, scenario. Those eight vectors are shown on the right, bottom right. We can have V1, V3, V2, V6, V4, and V5. So that is uh, six, one, two, three, four, five, six vectors. And then we have two zero vector possibilities. So let's maybe make this a little bit more practical. If we want this inverter to give me the vector V1, you see, you see there I need to switch 0, 0, 1. That means my, um, this, this, uh, def this terminology, 0, 0, 1, basically only refers to the top three RGBTs because we, we, the, the bottom three have to be the exact opposite um, of the top three. In other words, if the top RGBT is off, the bottom, its, its corresponding bottom RGBT has to be on. Um, it, they cannot both be on at the same time, otherwise you will have a short circuit. So we can define the vector only by finding the top three RGBTs. So for example, to achieve vector one, we need a zero, zero, one, uh, combination. So you can see on the top, uh, RGBT1 is not firing it at zero, RGBT2 is not firing it at zero, RGBT3 is firing it is at one. Um, and then the corresponding bottom RGBTs just need to be exactly the opposite. I can then transition to vector three by switching zero, one, one. 
RGBT1 on 0, RGBT2 RGBT on 1, so in other words, it's switching, RGBT3 on 1, it is switching. Vector V2, 0, 1, 0 on the top, it's displayed there. Um, and so we can and so we can continue and provide any of those eight vectors through different um, switching options. I then need to need to switch a combination of these of any two vectors to enable me to get to one single rotating vector. So just to simplify this discussion a little bit, we said earlier that my three individual sine sin, um, sin phases can be re represented by one single vector. I can simplify this using some transformation mathematics. I can define my single rotating vector by the addition of two vectors, which is exactly what we see on the VSD. We, we can switch any two of these vectors in certain percentages and achieve our rotating our single rotating vector at any given position and magnitude so if we look at this particular example if i want to achieve the vector that's shown at the bottom then i need to i need to switch a combination of my vector one which is zero zero one and my vector three, which is zero, zero, one, in a certain ratio in order to achieve that resultant vector. So in this specific example, if I switch that vector 68% of the time in the duty cycle, and I switch that vector 31% of the time in the duty cycle, I achieve that, that vector. Um, however, we normally add in zero vectors because I switch at a switching frequency, so I cannot keep my RGBT on for long pulses, long continuous pulses, but my ratio between these two vectors stay, the, stay exactly the same. I just introduce some additional zero vectors to adjust the magnitude. So this shows the relationship of those vectors for any given um, position in space and time. Okay, I hope everybody's with me. So we've covered input harmonics, we've covered output harmonics in some detail. Of course, we can go into more detail, uh, but for the purpose of this discussion, I think we've we've gone into sufficient detail to set the to set the tone. Right. The next thing we want to look at is some some detailed topologies to make it more practical of certain medium voltage drives that are available on the market. So the first one we're going to look at is the NPC three level um, arrangement using medium voltage RGBTs. So this topology should be should be known to most. Here we use in general um, a an input phase shift transformer. The simplest form being a 12 pulse, two secondaries. We can increase this to multiple secondaries. We need to then also increase the number of input rectifiers. Um, and this applies our DC link, which we split by a, introducing a neutral point. So the topology here yeah, looks very similar to a low voltage topology, except we introduce this neutral point and we're able to clamp this neutral point using the two inside IGBTs, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail shortly. Okay, some some add, um, or some characteristics of this of this particular topology, we can get away with a the, a simple two secondary transformer. This allows its construction and topology to be fairly simple and robust. Of all the medium voltage drive technologies available, this topology is undoubtedly the most efficient. When you're talking medium voltage drives, you're often talking in the large megawatt ranges. Efficiency differences of half a percent to one percent can make a dramatic difference to long-term costs, but also arguably more importantly, 
to the heat losses emitted into a substation. This topology is very re reliable because its component count is the lowest um, of, of the MV topologies available. It is a voltage source inverter, so it comes with all the advantages that a voltage source inverter provides. For example, very high dynamic response to a change in torque on the output of the drive. Um, it is possible to use plastic form capacitors as opposed to using dry um, electrolytic type capacitors. These have a much longer design life and they do not need to be reformed after storage. We are limited in this topology to 3.3, in fact, to, to 4.16 kV as the maximum output of this topology. And that's because we have reached the limitation of the voltage capability of IGBTs at that voltage output. Um, 11 kV and higher IGBTs are under research, but to this point are impractical for use in VSD applications. This topology, you'll see why later, but the motor does need to have a VSD rated insulation. Um, it, one advantage is that it has a low switching frequency because of a concept called optimal pulse pattern. Optimal pulse pattern is um, basically a step above space vector modulation. Um, in other words, it's even a better switching technique than space vector modulation. We'll cover that in, uh, in, in some broad strokes later. This topology uses 6.5 kV rated IGBTs. We always want a safety margin between the voltage that we're switching and the actual rating of the IGBTs. This design is fuseless, doesn't have to have fuses because I'm not, I do not have isolated secondaries. I have one, the VSD operates as a system. If I draw high current in any point in this VSD, it will be, um, it will be transmitted to the, to the primary switch gear. Because my transformer is a simple, uh, simple in construction, I have the option of making this topology with an integral dry type transformer or using an outdoor oil type transformer. The advantage, as I said, of this topology is that it is extremely efficient. You can see there more than 98.5, approaching 99% at full, not at nominal frequency. Because it's a voltage source inverter, the other advantage is that this efficiency curve is very flat. Even as we reduce speed, we still maintain a very high efficiency curve across the speed range. Right, let's dig into this topology in a little bit more detail. We have a utility supply, just for an example, 11 kV, supplying our, prime, our transformer primary. We split this, this um, transformer up into two secondaries for a 12 pulse, for a 12 pulse solution. Okay. This motor, th I'm looking at a 4.16 kV solution here, a 4,160 volt output to the motor. Okay. But I uh, divide my secondary voltages into two kV each because they each supply a series rectifier. And then my series rectifier supplies my DC link that is split by a neutral point. Because I introduce this neutral point, what happens is this, if I measure the voltage from the neutral point to the positive DC link, I would get, um, so I'm supplying two kV from my secondary, but because it's going through my diodes, I need to multiply that by 1.35 approximately. Um, so that would give me 3 kV if I measure from neutral point to positive DC link voltage. Then on the opposite side from this secondary, if I measure from that point to my negative DC link, I also measure 3 kV. What that means, because I clamp that neutral point, if I switch these IGBTs 
I'm not switching more than approximately 3 kV. And on this side, the same thing. I'm not switching more than 3 kV. But combined, if I measure on the output from phase to phase, my phase to phase voltage is um, 4.16 kV. So let me demonstrate that. If I fire the two inside IGBTs, this is this waveform that we're showing here is, is measuring from one phase, from one phase to the motor and neutral point. So we're literally measuring the phase, the, the, the phase voltage in one phase. If I switch my two inside RGBTs, I have zero volts going to my motor. So that is my zero volt step. I then transition from the two inside RGBTs to the two outside RGBTs. Notice that even though it looks like these RGBTs are connected in series, only one switches at a time. So I switch from my inside RGBT to my outside RGBT, and I'm now providing that full positive 3.3 kV phase to neutral. I then swing back to the inside, back to the outside, and so I can create a pulse with modulated phase to neutral voltage. I then do the same on the negative desealing side to provide my negative polarity voltage waveform to the motor. And that's essentially what it looks like. And let's just run through that little animation again. Switching the two inside RGBTs in one phase, two outside, back to the two inside, two outside, two inside, two outside, two inside, two outside, two inside. Then the, the two bottom outside, the inside again, the bottom outside, the inside, etc. So just to get back to the rating of the, the RGBTs, so I said that those RGBTs are rated for 6.5 kV. So let's just look at some general design principles when selecting a voltage rating for an RGBT for your device. Um, in low voltage VSDs, for example, a 5 to 5 volt VSDs, a VSD, a DC link could be up to 1.41 times that, so the square root of 2 times by my line voltage. Um, but normally it sits at an average of about 1.35 times my line, my line voltage. So in this case, my DC link could be as high as 708 volts. But now I want to um, install or design this VSD with, an, with a safety margin built into my RGBT. I don't want my RGBT failing. The general rule of thumb in power electronics is to use a safety factor of about 1.82. So if I'm switching 708 volts, I need to provide an IGBT that is at least rated for 1,289 volts. In the marketplace, it is possible to buy 1,700 volt rated IGBTs. And so those are the IGBTs of choice for 5 to 5 volt VSDs. The same principle applies to this topology in the medium voltage drive. If I have a line rated voltage of 4.16 kV, which is similar to what we've just uh, looked at as an example, my, if my topology was the same as a low voltage drive and I did not have that neutral point, I would need to, uh, my DC link voltage that I would need to switch on any single RGBT would be 6,000 volts. If I applied my safety margin, of 1.82 to that 6,000 volts, I would need an IGBT that is rated for 8,100 volts. Okay, it does not exist. They, they are, there is a lot of research into 11 kV IGBTs, but at this point, they have not hit a breakthrough. So the highest rated um, IGBT in regular use is a 6.5 kV IGBT. But fortunately, our topology is not like a low voltage topology. We have the neutral points introduced, like I showed you. And so our DC link voltage in the 4.16 kV case that any IGBT would be switching 
is limited to 3000 volts. If I apply my safety factor to that, it means my device would need to be rated as a minimum of 5.4 kV, but I use 6.5 kV devices. All right, just to show you how it all comes together. So if I look at my phase to neutral voltage um, for phase A, and, my, and I combine it with my phase to neutral voltage in phase B for the same 4.16 kV system. The, I subtract A, uh, sorry, I subtract B from A to get my phase to phase voltage. So you can see, although I'm only sitting at 3000 volts maximum for a phase to neutral voltage in phase A and the same for phase B, when I combine the two, the sum of the two takes me up to my peak voltage of 6,000, which gives me my RMS voltage 4.16 kV. Uh, that's the that's a theoretical or simulated voltage waveform. This is an actual measurement of the output voltage waveform. And this is an actual measurement of the current waveform drawn at the motor terminals. So why it's called an NPC three level is I'm able to create my three levels. Remember, I am, this is phase to phase. I can now have a, uh, sorry, in actual fact, phase, yeah, phase, to f phase to phase, sorry, I'm actually five levels. Let's just go back a little bit. Let's just talk about these levels. So. We normally define a topology by its number of levels in the phase to neutral case. Um, that those number of levels always increases in the phase to phase case. So this is called an NPC three level topology because in the phase to neutral voltage scenario, I have positive DC link voltage when I'm switching my two upper IGBTs or I have zero when I'm switching my two inside IGBTs. So that's my second level. And then my third level is when I'm switching my outside two, bottom two IGBTs, I have maximum negative uh, DC link voltage. And that's where my three levels come from. But when I combine these two, I actually get a five level voltage waveform to the motor. So if we look here at the voltage A to B, I have 6,000 volt, 3000 volt, zero volt, minus 3000, minus 6000, that's five levels. And that's just an actual measurement of it. I'm just having a little technical issue with my next slide here. Let's see if it works now. There we go. I'm sorry, we just had a little technical glitch there. I hope everybody's seeing what I'm seeing now. Okay, now we're going to. We earlier on we examined space vector modulation and the combin the switching combinations for a low voltage VSD, which had three legs two RGBTs per leg, so six RGBTs in total. Now we're going to look at the switching combination possibilities for this NPC three-level topology. So essentially, yeah, we increase the number of switching combinations dramatically because now we have three possible switching combinations. Let's go back. We, have, we examined them earlier. We'll, we'll, have a more, we'll have a detailed look at them in a moment on the animation. 
but we can switch either the top two RGBTs, that's switching position one, we can switch the two inside RGBTs, that's switching position two, or we can switch the bottom two RGBTs, that's switching position three. So I have three switching positions per leg, and I have three legs. So mathematically, I have three to the power of three possible switching combinations that results in 27 possible uh, switching vectors. Let's have a look at some of them. I have um, on the low voltage vectors, you'll remember, I had only essentially in terms of magnitude, two choices of vectors. Either my, I, I had a large vector or I had a zero vector. I had no in between. In order for me to create the output vector that I want the motor to see, I needed to um, add zero, um, zero switching, sorry, a combination of two large vectors switching to give me my direction. And I needed to add zero vector switching in the duty cycle to decrease or increase the amplitude. Okay, let's look at this slightly more complex scenario now. Here I have a large ve vector um, possibility as shown. This particular vector is PNN. This is just a, another way of, of, um, of defining the switching. So PNN means positive, negative, negative. It means in my, in my leg one or in my arm one, I'm switching the positive DC link, or positive half the DC link. In my second, negative, and in my third, negative. That gives me my large, uh, this, this large vector. I have medium vectors as an option by switching, for example, P0N. My first arm is switching positive. My second arm is switching zero. My third arm is switching negative. And then I also have short vectors. My short vectors for this example, my short vectors are interesting because for the same short vector, I have two possible switching options. So for this short vector, my first option is positive zero, zero, which can be seen here, positive zero, zero. I also have the option of switching zero, negative, negative. Shown here, I can switch zero, negative, negative, and achieve exactly the same vector. Okay, now let's take an example of, um, I want to provide the space vector that is shown in green. That is what my motor is demanding for, for its specific operating point related to its speed and its voltage. Um, that is represented by the green vector. So that is my desired vector. That is what I want to uh, provide to the motor in terms of my voltage and frequency output. So I've, I've got a number of options. In my low voltage drive, I could only switch a combination of two vectors. And those would be the two vectors that were closest to the desired vector. And I would switch them in different uh, um, ratios, different percentages in order to to achieve my desired vector. You will see now, I start having a lot more options available to me to achieve this desired vector. Let me show you what I mean. In order to achieve that desired vector shown, I can switch my one large vector and this small vector, because my desired vector falls in between the two, I just need to adjust the percentages, add some zero switching into my duty cycle to um, adjust the magnitude. But by, by switching between these two vectors, I'm able to provide this single space vector to my motor. But that's not my only option to achieve that one space vector. I can actually switch this medium vector with a short vector. Likewise, I can switch this medium with this large. And going back to the short vector, I have an additional option because I can I can choose which of the two short switching vector switching patterns I, um, I, I can use. So 
ultimately, I have to tell my VSD to, in order to achieve the desired space vector that my motor is demanding, I need to tell my VSD which are the two best options to choose. Okay. Um, and depending on spe some specific uh, speed and, and voltage requirements of the motor, that the selection of which of those two vectors is optimal is often can have a, a dramatic effect on the amount of harmonics that is provided to the, to the motor. In standard space vector modulation, the, it, the drive does not have the built-in intelligence to compare which out of those number of possibilities to achieve that single space vector is, is optimal. And so because of that, we've developed an additional uh, step up from space, simple space vector modulation uh, used utilizing something called optimal pulse pattern. Basically, what this does is for every desired space vector that my motor demands for a given voltage and speed uh, requirement, I have built up a database over years of supplying motors and VSDs of what is for, every, for almost every infinite space vector position. What are my best, what is my best vector switching combination to use? And what is my best switching frequency to use in order to give the least amount of harmonics to my motor? And as a result of this optimal, so basically this is a very large algorithm database that the VSD draws from it from in real time to determine what my best relationship of switching vectors is going to be. And you can see from the diagrams that it has a dramatic improvement. So what this diagram shows is um, this compares space vector modulation versus optimal pulse pattern switching, which uses space vector modulation but tells my drive exactly which are the optimal vectors to use. And it compares them with relation to harmonics. So this first harmonic profile that you see here is my um, harmonic magnitude of my fundamental with respect to my modulation index. So remember earlier on we said we increase our modulation index from zero to one as we increase my drive speed from zero to full speed. And we already discussed earlier that we have an increase in the harmonic magnitude as we increase our modulation index. So that can clearly be seen here. And that is normal. So we don't want to change that. So in both scenarios, we have that same situation. However, our non-useful or wasted harmonics also increase as we increase our modulation index. And you can see that at full load, at full modulation index, my, in this particular case, my 11th and 13th, for example, harmonics are a problem and, and so on as I get my higher order harmonics. But you can see these harmonics are quite high. With optimal pulse pattern switching, I am able to, through some very fancy algorithms, at any given modulation index by changing my switching frequency and which vectors I switch, I'm able to almost eliminate a lot of the harmonics, um, the, the, the higher order harmonics. So this has a, a very profound effect on my VSD itself. It allows me, so when I, when I have a high harmonic content that I need to cater for when I select a, an RGBT, uh, I need to oversize that IGBT to take care of that wasted current. So what we show here is that for the same harmonic distortion, if I compare carrier type switching versus optimal switching, if I maintain the same harmonic distortion output, I can increase the current rating capability of that device from just over 250 amps to 
almost as high as 600 amps. In other words, I'm able to get a lot more output current from the same device just by um, adjusting how I actually switch to the motor. This allows me to make a much more compact drive that is capable of, uh, of, of producing higher currents from a device, or it allows me to dramatically decrease the switching frequency for the same harmonic distortion. Right, I hope everybody's with me. Let's just take a quick look at how we're doing time-wise. Yeah, we're doing okay. All right, so that was the NPC topology. The next, uh, that is now finished, we're going to look at the cascaded H-bridge multi-level inverted topology. This topology is a lot more flexible in terms of its output voltage capability because we, yeah, we indefinitely string together as many series um, power arms containing RGBTs. We put them in series and we can add as many as we want. So this allows us to supply from 3.3 kV right up to 13.8 kV output on these drives. So you've seen this topology, I'm sure, many, many times. Let's just cover it in some detail. Um, as I increase my output voltage to my motor, so I need to increase the number of secondary, uh, sorry, the number of power arms that I have in a phase. Generally, this topology makes use of low voltage RGBTs, not the 6.5 kV type RGBTs that we were discussing in the NPC topology. These low voltage RGBTs, uh, on, we normally use 690 volt power cells. Each power cell looks like a single phase low voltage VSD as shown. Uh, and we can string them together in series to achieve anything from 3.3 kV using three cells per phase as shown. That means nine total cells, three in each phase, three, six, nine. Um, and we, for each power cell that we put in series in a phase, we need to have its own separate isolated secondary supply because this, this, this specific power cell, each one is only able to switch a 690 volt maximum. And so I, I have to isolate these secondaries and give each one its own isolated supply. So if I have nine secondary, if I have nine power cells to give me a 3.3 kV output, I need nine secondary windings. For a 6.6 .6 kV device or drive, I need to double, I'm doubling my voltage now from 3.3 .3 to 6.6. .6, so it stands to reason I need to double my number of cells per phase from three to six. And in total, my cells will double it also from nine to 18. And then I also need 18 secondary windings. So that is the reason you can see we naturally increase the number of pulses as we increase the number of cells. Why? Because we've got to put in additional secondaries anyway. So we may as well make use of that fact, even though earlier on we said, look, 12 pulse, 18 pulse going beyond that is not really giving you much return for your added complexity. Here we've got to increase our complexity um, due to the nature of the switching not the, the harmonics, but I may as well make use of that complexity that I'm adding, that number of secondaries, to also increase the number of pulses to improve my input harmonics. All right, and then 11 kV, it's generally done at 10 cells per phase, 30 total cells, and then we can go right up to 13.8 kV. Some characteristics of this topology is a voltage source inverter, gives you all the advantages of a voltage source inverter. It has a large number of components compared to a neutral point clamp topology of the same size. It stands to reason. I've got all these additional secondaries, whereas the NPC, I only needed a, a minimum of two secondaries. Now I've got to put in a minimum of nine for a 3.3 kV solution. I've got to put in a minimum of nine power cells. In my NPC topology, I only needed three power cells. So it adds a lot of components. This does decrease the efficiency of this topology. Um, but these, the, the, the low voltage IGBTs have been used for a long time. And so there's some robustness because of the, um, the, the, the IGBTs that are, that are used. 
the other thing because I am I am building up each phase voltage with a number of smaller voltages. I have this kind of redundancy where I can almost afford to lose, especially in the case of 6.6 kV and higher, because I've got six or more cells per phase. I, I'm almost in a position where if one if one power cell becomes faulty and I'm able somehow to bypass it, um, I can utilize this VSD at slightly reduced cap capability, um, but it is possible to still operate for some time. So we have this redundancy, increased redundancy. This also helps to reduce the spares cost uh, compared to the NPC topology. The efficiency is not as high as the NPC. Yeah, we're talking about 96.5% compared to the previous 98.5 to 99%. This is this is for two reasons. Because we're adding more, more RGBTs, there's more switching, but also because here we have to have an integral transformer. It does not make sense for us to put an oil type transformer outdoors. So it means that the heat losses from the transformer have to be taken into consideration. As I've mentioned, I, uh, we do have internal cell bypass possible. If you lose one cell, it can be bypassed and you can continue to operate at reduced uh, output capacity. Yeah, you do need fuses. Because we are dividing the power into smaller isolated secondaries, I could potentially have a overcurrent or short circuit or fault on one of these power cells. But it, because it is only 690 volt isolated supply, it may be too small a current to cause the upstream circuit breaker from tripping. That's why I need um, more localized protection, and that's why I have to incorporate fuses on this topology. The one advantage here is that I can use this on standard machines or retrofit machines. In most cases, bear in mind, we still have a pulse width modulated output, so the motor does need to be taken into consideration but I can increase the number of levels of my output voltage on this topology, um, which is helpful and beneficial to my motor. All right, let's first examine how we define this drive in terms of the number of levels. So you saw previously that a 3.3 kV drive needs actually three power cells per phase. I'm just showing a simplified example of a drive that would theoretically have two power cells per phase, six power cells in total. So the way that we determine what is the output level per phase, a phase to neutral, as well as the output voltage phase to phase in these drives is given by the formulas below. So to determine the phase to neutral number of levels, we take the um, M, which is the number of of power cells per phase multiplied by two and add one. So in this case, we have two power cells multiplied by two plus one gives me five. Five levels phase to neutral. Our phase to phase voltage, uh, number of levels, is my phase to neutral, which is five, times by two, which is ten. Uh, sorry, it's uh, phase to neutral times. 2, 5 times 2 is 10, minus 1 is 9. Um, so I've actually made a little error there. But it would be, yeah, so it would be five, 5 levels, my apologies, that's, uh, I, I was using the number of, of cells per phase instead of the phase to neutral uh, number of levels. So it should actually be 9. All right, let's look at the switching of each of these power cells and how we build them up to create a medium voltage output to the motor. So if we look at our switching combinations of one single power cell, I can switch uh, my, two, my S2 and S4. That gives me a zero voltage level to the, um, to the motor. I can switch my S2 and S3 my S2 and S3 on, that gives me for this drive, it's positive DC uh, link voltage to the motor. I can then switch my S1 and S3, that gives me zero voltage. 
I can then switch my S1 and S4, and that gives me negative, my negative DC link voltage to the motor. In this case, my DC link voltage is related to 690 volt. So it would be 690 volt times by the square root of three, after the square root of two. I then can switch each power cell in combination in order to build up my voltage waveform to the motor. So let's quickly, let's look at a simplified way of how we can do that. If I switch U1 at its maximum positive, and I do not switch any of the other devices, essentially I'm providing my first level of voltage to my machine. Then if I switch U1 and U2 together simultaneously in combination, I am then doubling my output voltage level to the motor. I can then switch one, two, and three, and triple my voltage output to the motor. The blue waveform shown is for a 6.6 .6 kV VSD, which has got six power cells in each phase. Um, for the animation, I'm only going to show up to three phases, up to three power cells per phase, which would be equivalent to a 3.3 kV output. Okay. Once I've switched up to maximum of three times, I can then come back down again by removing um, by removing power cells from the switching sequence. So just to check the levels again. So at this point now, I am switching three 690 volt power cells. That gives me a total of 2070 volts. That is my first level, my upper level, my highest level. I can then take my third um, power device, uh, stop switching, switch only my two inside devices, and I reduce to 13, 690 volt times two is 1380 volts. That is my second level. And then my first level is 690 times 1 equals 690 volts. And then, of course, I can um, switch at 0 volts. I don't switch any of my devices, and my, volt, my motor will see 0 volts at its terminals. And that is my fourth level. I can then switch at um, on the negative side, which is um, my 5, 6, and 7 levels. So that's why for, for a for a if we use that formula from previously, a three um, if I have three power cells times by two, that's six plus one gives me seven levels capability phase to neutral switching. Um, and that graphically demonstrates my seven levels there. My phase to phase voltage is essentially my line to line of, uh, my, sorry, my phase to neutral voltage of 2070 times by the square root of three. So when I'm switching on a 3.3 kV, three power cell per phase drive at its maximum, it is capable of switching up to 3585 voltage. That is why three output power cells of 690 volts each is used for 3.3 kV applications. If I look at a 6.6 .6 kV case, I now have six 690 volt power cells per phase. So my line to neutral voltage can be extended to 4,140 volts. For my line to line voltage, I multiply that by the square root of three and that takes me up to 7,100 volts. So that is why a six power cell per phase um, drive is used for 6.6 .6 kV applications. Right. This just shows that um, that waveform. Well, this shows each phase to neutral waveform for U phase, for V phase, and then how they combine to increase the number of number of levels in my phase to phase output voltage. Um, so the the way that we investigated or or just or, um, showed how that switching works was a very simplified case. Just to just to show how how it works in principle, but in reality we do it slightly differently because we don't want. Let's just go back here. If we were to use this kind of switching in reality, what we would find is that our U1 needs to be switching or staying on for 
a lot longer time than when I reach my higher level. Why? Because this forms the foundation that I need to build on to get to my next levels. Likewise, my second power cell would also need to be on for a long time, not as long as the first, but also long because it forms the second foundation. And so I would, I would have these IGBTs working very, very hard, this one, but these ones on the output not doing any work. So we adjust that by doing a little bit, um, some fancy footwork on our switching, and we switch it in such a way that we, we achieve the same result, but by doing this a similar um, switching frequency for each of the power cells. One particular advantage to an H cell multi level inverter um, is demonstrated or can be demonstrated by a solution that we supplied to SABS for their, te their pump test bay. So, what we supplied to them was a multi level H cell inverter that is capable of switching at its maximum 11 kV. Okay, but it is also able to switch at reduced voltage outputs, um, even at maximum frequency. So they are able to use this drive to test multiple pump motor systems from 3.3 kV, 6.6 kV, and higher up to 11 kV using the exact same VSD and still obtaining maximum frequency and output voltage for that specific motor. I've got some videos just to demonstrate the, the actual measurements of the waveforms. This first one, is when we are doing a 50 hertz full speed output at 3.3 kV from this drive. We are ramping up the voltage at the moment until we get to maximum voltage. So this is measuring phase to phase voltage. So we can see there that our scale is 1000, that's 200 volt scale, 1000 to one. So we have 2000, 4000, close to 5000 volt peak, which gives me an RMS voltage of 3.3 kV. And my frequency um, output is 50, 50 Hertz. Just to show it on the nameplate. So we've, running this motor at a speed of 1500 RPM, 50 Hertz. Our output RMS voltage to the motor is 3.3 kV with no nasty peak voltages sitting at 11 kV. That is the advantage of this topology. Let me show you the same drive, but now supplying output power to a 6.6 .6 kV motor, ramping up, get to full frequency, full voltage, gamma scale is 1000 times 400, so we have 4000, 8000, we're sitting at just, uh, just roughly below 10,000 volts peak, which is an RMS voltage of approximately 6.9 kV. So yeah, we're again running the motor at 1500 RPM. This is a 6.6 .6 kV motor running at, uh, sorry, it's actually a 6.9 kV motor running at 50 Hertz. There's my output voltage just under 6.9 kV. All right, but, uh, let's just see how we're doing time wise. Yeah, yeah, we're not far from finishing. I hope everybody's staying awake. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that on this topology, because we are using smaller, um, uh, we're dividing our output voltage up into smaller components, we have some redundancy. Um, and so if we are able to bypass a faulty cell, theoretically, we can still continue to operate our load, but at reduced um, power output. This just demonstrates that capability. Here we have, um, and here we have all, all our power cells healthy. We're showing all three output phases to the, to the motor. But let's say in the U phase, we have a faulty power cell. Then the drive would automatically disable and stop uh, providing voltage from all three phases to the machine. We can bypass 
the faulty power cell. We would then reduce the output voltage from this from this U phase. This um, would result in an imbalance between the three phases. So we we using software algorithms, we also reduce the output voltage in the other two phases in order to achieve a balanced three phase output voltage to the to the to the load. But the, cap the cap capability and the voltage capability is reduced. So if it's a fan or something that can be run at a reduced speed, it's possible to, uh, to, to run the load even at a slightly reduced voltage output. This makes a lot of sense when you start increasing the number of power cells in each phase because now the percentage of voltage loss if you lose one power cell becomes very small and almost negligible in many cases. That's one method of bypass. There is an additional method of cell bypass where you bypass the cell, the, the faulty cell in the one phase, but instead of reducing the amplitude of the voltage output in the other phase and the other two phases to find balance, what you do is again, because we are in control of the algorithms of firing the, the voltage output to the motor, we make some adjustments to the phase angle between the three phases in order to balance the phases with a very limited reduction in output voltage. Okay, that's the end of our discussion on H cell multi level inverters. Now we discuss the third. Um, the third inverter topology. This is essentially a hybrid between the NPC topology and the H cell topology that is available for a 6.6 .6 kV um, application only, cannot go up to 11 kV, but it gives you some benefit of both topologies where you have to have the 6.6 .6 kV output. Um, here we need only six secondary windings, whereas on the on the typical H cell, we would need 18 secondary windings. So we're able to reduce the complexity of the transformer somewhat. We use a similar topology in the output inverter section that we use in the NPC 4.16 kV version. So you can see is you can already start seeing the hybrid between the NPC and the isolated supplies of the H cell. So essentially, yeah, we isolating this into two set, each set of two secondaries is an isolated um, supply to an inverter, which now becomes essentially your power cell of your of um, your H cell inverter. So we've got three similar H cell topologies, but each of these power cells is able to have the switching combinations of an NPC topology. So this is um, something of a of a good go between when if the application requires it. Just to very quickly show you this how the switching works for each power cell. That's very similar to what we've already covered. We can switch the two cells highlighted for zero voltage. We can switch the, the, the power cell shown for zero voltage or the power cell shown. So we've got three options for zero voltage in this case. Then we can do um, our first step by switching as shown. We switch those three RGBTs. We can increase that step by switching as shown. And so we can build up our steps to the motor. We have five levels, so it's it's higher than the three levels that we get from a traditional NPC neutral point clamp topology, um, which is three levels. This is five levels, but it's lower than what we would get from a an H cell multi level inverter um, in 6.6 .6 kV, which would be 25. Uh, sorry, would be 13 levels. This shows an actual measurement of that voltage waveform phase to phase, as well as the current at the motor terminals. Okay, now we're bringing this thing into a landing. We've discussed the three main topologies that we wanted to discuss. Just as a final takeaway, um, we've developed uh, some 
some pretty nifty software solutions for various applications. This just shows you one application uh, showing protection in intelligent built in frozen charge protection done by a VSD on a mill application. So what we do, what we show in green there is a typical mill starting torque curve. Um, if a mill has a frozen charge, in other words, if the material is stuck to the side of the mill and it goes beyond a certain angle where cascading should start to occur of that material, that frozen charge can fall and damage the linings of the mill. So it is quite valuable if the VSD can detect it. So we monitor, we do that by monitoring torque. So as our mill angle increases, we, if we do not, if cascading does not occur inside the mill, it pretty much means that the mill torque will not start to drop off as expected. We can calculate that on the VSD, and within a certain range of that torque increasing, we can determine that there is a frozen charge and abort the start. Okay, Theo, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, you are still on the slide showing the ball. Let's try and see why. No, oh, there we go. Thanks, <laughs> Um, Yeah, so we have a couple of questions. Um, guys, just a reminder the. Um, question panel is there so please do ask we've got a couple or three questions um so far kirk i think this was a, a very detailed uh, approach and now i've lost the questions just give me two seconds okay. there we go it's um, difficult to yeah. cover these subjects without getting into a little bit of detail that's the the challenge. Yeah, yeah, but it's a lot of useful detail. Uh, that's what I like. Um, yeah, so Kirk, first question is from Louis Cook. Oh, the first two questions in actuality. Um, so, what practical applications would require more than a two, 24 pulse rectifier? What is the network constraints uh, that must be considered to inform the rectifier pulse um, number to limit uh, total harmonic distortion within the NRS requirements? Um, I think you also have access to the question portion, uh, Kirk. So maybe uh, just let me see. Uh, okay, no. let me see. How do I find that? Just a moment. Ah, here we go. Uh, I don't, eh? I only see... No, okay, I don't I see any questions in, in my chat. Um, okay, are you... Okay, let me... I'll copy and paste this question uh, to the chat, um, if you can see it, but... Uh, yeah, I think if we can start with the practical applications that require 24 pulse rectifiers. Well, so what, this is actually specifically why I compared the three the three topologies that I that I did. So if you remember the the slides that I showed regarding um, the the different phase shifting and multi pulse rectifiers with regards to their harmonic distortion, um, you will see you would have seen that from a normal six pulse rectifier where you're getting like thirty six percent THDI. As soon as you increase that to a 12 pulse, you're dropping dramatically to somewhere around 10%. Yeah. Then if you increase that to, which for most applications on any reasonably strong network is going to be fine. Ultimately, what it comes down to is how much, how many devices are you installing on a certain network? If you've only got a one megawatt and you've got a 40 MVA um, utility transformer, and then more than likely a 12 pulse is going to be more than sufficient. The only time I'd say you really need to start looking beyond 12 pulse is if your load, if your if your 
MV is VSD is very very high with respect to the to the to the supply transformer. That's when it starts to become an issue. So we would recommend 12 pulse for most applications if you can get away with it. Remember that that 12 pulse configuration is is convenient for the NPC topology, which is limited to 4.16 kV. If you need to in increase your voltage, if you've got 6.6 .6 kV motor requirements or 11 kV motor requirements, there we cannot use the NPC topology. There we have to go for a, some kind of an H cell design, whether, whether it's the hybrid or whether it's the full H cell H bridge. On that H bridge, because from a switching perspective, we already have to add secondaries to the transformer. We're not necessarily doing it to, to in, improve the input harmonics. We're doing it because we need to supply isolated secondaries to each 690 volt power cell. But we inherently need to put a lot of secondaries, secondary windings. So we may as well make use of that and, um, and increase the number of pulses to, to kill two bits with one stone. Yeah, awesome. But it, it doesn't um, necessarily yeah. mean it's the right it's the right solution to go for. Yeah, so you'll have to do an analysis to determine what's best fit for purpose, and does the uh, actual yeah. uh, benefit justify the cost? Correct. So uh, harmonic analysis is normally is, is normally good to do. NRS 048 stipulates that for a general system, at the point of common coupling between that system, or they define it as the customer because it's, it's written by ESCOM. So the, cust the customer needs to ensure that they, for a general plant, so I'm not talking about a hospital or an Air Force base, or a, I'm not mm. talking about that. I'm talking about a general system. So a mine or a plant or a factory or whatever. That factory plant, whatever, that customer, according to NRS 048, needs to ensure that their harmonic distortion at the point of common coupling of the transformer that supplies that plant um, and, um, and supplies other customers at that point, which is the point upstream of, this, of the transformer that supplies that customer. At that point, your THDV, your total harmonic distortion voltage, must not be more than 8%. That is very lenient, very, very lenient. You will always get, a, get away with a 12 pulse system even if your 12 pulse VSD is loading your that supply transformer 100%, which is never going to happen. Um, but yeah. e even in that case, you'll get away with a with a 12 pulse system. Okay, awesome, uh, Louis. Um, I think that answers the question uh, for the most part. So, if, if there's a portion that you are not happy with, or that you would like her uh, to elaborate, just uh, post another question. Meantime, we're going to quickly move on to the next one that's also from you. Um, so, Kirk, uh, do you would like to know what are the practical limitations? Are they um, what what la practical limitations are there for active front end drives that should be considered um, when you are considering using a active front end drive? Okay, excellent question. Excellent question. So, active front end VSDs replace the diode rectifier with a switching rectifier. So the mm. inverter section with RGBTs now looks exactly the same as your rectifier section. It also has RGBTs. OK, different manufacturers use different switching devices. Um, some use thyristors um, you know, of different sorts. But that's essentially yeah. what you're doing with an active front end drive. If you are doing that, in my opinion, only to improve your harmonics, then I believe there are better ways to do it. Let me give you some backup or some reasons why I say that. An active front end drive is a very good VSD, but its main application is when you have regenerative load that needs to be put back into the supply. For example, if you have a decline conveyor that is fully loaded, you, the BSD is no longer motoring that conveyor, it is actually breaking that conveyor. If you have a diode front end VSD on, on, a, on a, a, a decline conveyor, it will more than likely trip on a DC link over voltage while you are trying to break that conveyor, unless you connect a large resistor um, to your DC link terminals, in which case you can dissipate that return energy back to, uh, into the resistor. 
but it is in that application it is very beneficial to put in an active front end vsd okay or on a centrifuge where the centrifugal force once you get it up to its full speed that centrifugal force um, actually starts to regenerate and and put energy back into the drive those are some examples where an active front end drive would really be in its own if but the, the disadvantage to an active front end drive is that you're replacing an extremely robust device. Just to give you an idea, a diode that we use on a medium voltage drive diode rectifier, that thing is almost bulletproof. We use a, a, a diode that is capable of withstanding an impulse voltage of 65 kV on a 3.3 kV drive cool. system. Okay, so it is bulletproof. It's very difficult to blow up or destroy a diode. Also, it's got no hardwired firing circuit. It commutates automatically. It's a self-commutating device. This is the simplest electronic device you can get. So your the reliability and robustness of it is, is unquestionable. When you replace that with switching devices, you are completely changing the game. Also, because those switching devices now, so yes, we have switching devices on the inverter. But those are protected from the supply by decoupling through the diode rectifier and the DC link. Now you're putting those same switching devices directly at the mercy of your supply conditions. That is why you are dramatically reducing the robustness and reliability of your drive solution if you're using an active front end drive. And that is why I wouldn't recommend using it if your only intention of using it is to decrease the input harmonics. If you have to use it for the application, like the examples I gave, then, then use it. If you don't have to use it for the application, 95% of applications can do with can make do with a diode rectifier bridge, then use a diode rectifier bridge and use a, a, a built-in phase shift transformer. It is much more robust. So I think that kind of addresses a common misconception that um, a lot of people have. They, they fear having harmonic problems and immediately kind of um, go to movies to say, okay, but we'll take an active front end drive and that'll solve all our problems. Um, but as you just mentioned, uh, that's not necessarily the best use of the capabilities of an active um, front end. But uh, if we look past um, input chokes and such, what would you suggest to help limit those uh, harmonics being injected back into the system if we don't use an active front end. For, uh, on low voltage drives, so that really um, depends I'm on the percent. The oh. Okay, so on, on MV, MV drives inherently never get um, supplied like a low voltage drive. They, they, there are no six pulse. There used to be when, when MV drives were first developed, you, were, you had a, a six pulse diode rectifier MV drive. But because they they are always going to be high megawatts, it was it became very quickly uh, quickly apparent that the manufacturer needed to already take care of the harmonics himself to to not make it the end user's problem. So that's why there's been an evolution in MV MV drives towards either multi di, multi pulse diode rectifiers with corresponding phase shift transformers to reduce the the, the harmonics um, or Use or, or regenerative drives, um, but again, okay. for the reasons that I've stated, I would I would steer away from a regenerative drive if you're only using it for the purpose of reducing harmonics. But I just want to say one additional important thing about re regenerative drives here: when most standards that evaluate harmonics and put limits and etc. to harmonics evaluate from the from the first order to the fiftieth order. That means 50 times your supply frequency. But when you have an active front end drive, because IGBTs are capable of switching thousands of times per second, you introduce a, an harmonic content that often goes well above the 50th component. And this is mm. not well understood and not well re researched or limited by any standards, but um, can cause a, a lot of problems. And so normally you would you would end up putting to stop those little high frequency distortions, you end up putting quite a large filter at the input of a, a um, regenerative drive anyway, which is almost similar 
in impedance, size, etc., to a transformer. So okay. my logic is if you want to lim eliminate harmonics or reduce harmonics, an active front end drive or regenerative drive is not the best way to, to do that. So again, uh, fit for purpose applications when you are considering uh, active front end. Correct. Um, then quick uh, comment, uh, a compliment from CJ Moorman saying he, um, he's not bored or asleep. Um, a lot of sense being made here. Um, so thanks for that, Thank CJ. Um, okay, so uh, Lazy would like um, to know if you would be willing to explain the uh, NPC H bridge again. And um, okay, can you achieve redundancy in the VSD? So I think if we can just highlight again the redundancy. Uh, I think he's trying trying to find out if you can get that similar redundancy that you would with a multi-cell drive. Yeah, it's impractical. Let me maybe go back to the to a couple of slides. Those slides. Um, yeah. So let's let's start off here. Let's start off with the normal H cell. Um, so in the normal H cell, we've this is a six, this is an example of a 6.6 .6 kV drive system. In this system, we have six of 690 volt power cells per phase, each one only accounting for 690 volts, which is what is that? That's only 10% of the phase of the phase voltage. So effectively, you can you can lose one of these power cells and, uh, and bypass it without having a dramatic effect on the output voltage. In addition, there's another thing that you can do here. You can actually build this drive. You can manufacture a 6.6 .6 kV drive and put seven power cells in each phase. Because this power cell is small and simple, it's literally a little single phase low voltage VSD. It's not expensive. You can add another one in. Remember, it comes at the cost of reduced efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the, this is one of the advantages of this of this topology. You can add a seventh cell, even though you don't need it. That's um, not going to impact the cost that dramatically. And now you've got proper redundancy. Now, if you lose a cell in any one phase, you can bypass that cell and get 100% voltage output. Yeah? And it makes sense for this topology. But if we go to the, the hybrid, the hybrid topology is using, these are big power arms. Just to give you an idea, one of these power arms that's showing in the dotted lines, remember the advantage to these power arms is they're using 6.5 kV RGBTs, very, very efficient devices, excellent. But they're big, they're expensive. So in one arm, you have a large cost base sitting there, and it represents a large overall percentage. In fact, it's 50% of your phase to neutral voltage. So it's, it would be very expensive and take up a lot of space in the drive if I added an extra redundant power cell into this topology. Also, I don't have a simple bypass. The bypass here is simple because I'm only bypassing a 690 volt power cell. Here, I'm dealing with much higher voltages. Here, I'm bypassing, you're talking more than 3000 volts. So I'd need a more mm -hmm. robust bypass circuit as well. It's not a commercially practical to add redundancy to this uh, hybrid topology. But that being said, this topology is inherently more reliable as a total system solution. Let's let's ex let's compare why. I've only got six secondary windings here compared to 18 for the H cell for, for the same voltage. I've got six diode rectifiers compared to 18. I've got uh, one, I've got six power arms compared to 18. So there is arguably less reason to put in bypass and redundancy on this topology. Um, but you know, it's, it's got a couple of disadvantages. It's not as motor friendly with the output is five level phase to neutral nine level compared to the 6.6 .6 kV, which is, I mean, the H, the H cell, which is 13 level and 25 level, phase to neutral and phase to phase. 
So the, it's a lot of give and take. I get, for me, the, the big takeaway here is um, don't just decide on a and an MVVSD topology because you like it or you happen to have installed it before, you're used to it. Always look at the specific application and where possible, invite the manufacturer to participate in the decision making process with you. Because there's, we've used this uh, this this um, hybrid in a lot of cases, but not all cases. There's other cases yeah. that were better suited to the 6.6 kV H line, but it really depends on too many factors to discuss. Yeah, you need to be looked at it each in each application. Agreed. But Elisa, I think that uh, does answer your question. Um, Kirk uh, Gerte Beer just made a. Um, comment uh, further, furthering the discussion on the active front ends just to note um, an additional fallback on the um, front the active front end is that it will um, also generate current in the neutrals of your network you can maybe comment on that yeah so i'm not not too too knowledgeable on that to be honest i'd have to i'd have to have a look at it but yeah that's interesting i'll actually i'll actually research that myself Okay. So all, all um, drives do give you do give you some return back to neutral. Um, all hmm. VSDs just by the nature of their output switching. But I'll I'll investigate it myself on on active front end drives. Might have something to do with that high frequency component. Hmm. Um, Thanks, Pat. Thank think, you. I'll yeah, Pat, if you can maybe elaborate also on that, then uh, Kirk can also look into it further. Um, then. Okay, so a lot of uh, compliments today, uh, Kurt. Uh, next one is from. Thank you. Oh, this, so part one was more out of my comfort zone because it was more motor related. This is more my, this is my specialty. So this was more in my wheelhouse. Thank you. So interestingly enough, um, if you look at the attendees, um, shout out to Albert, who's also a motor specialist with a PhD in motors. Um, so so he was actually listening to last week and this week's. Uh, uh, seminar. Um, then uh, Rolf Junger said, Kirk, uh, I once again found your presentation extremely useful, did not understand um, all of it, but uh, well presented nonetheless. Thanks. Um, Thank you, Rolf. Then Sipilele, um is asking in reducing um, slash improving the current uh, harmonic distortion. Um, you maintain a reactor can be added as well. Uh, what is a reactor? Um, and then by increasing the pulses um, to reduce the uh, current distortion, can we have a distortion free drive? We'll leave that to you. Um, I think. So let, yeah. can I start with the last question first? Is it possible to have Not a distortion-free distortion drive? Yeah, yeah, the answer is no. Uh, the answer is no. It is, it is not possible to have a distortion-free drive. And let's take this back one step. It is not possible to have a distortion-free system. No utility yeah. network supply is got, has got 0% harmonics. When at the generation point of the utilities, there's already an, an influence of harmonics put into the system. So you will, you will always find a, a system that has harmonics. In addition to that, most systems have a slight, a slight imbalance. So it is, it is we, when you talk about a zero distortion, you're assuming an ideal scenario which does not exist in the real world. So even if it were theoretically possible to have a distortion-free VSD, that would not be practically possible because you never have a distortion-free system or network. Um, and then, yeah. but then the, the, what was the other part of the, uh, the, the question about reactors? So reactors yeah. are something, are, are some devices that are applied. They are, they are basically an inductive core, similar to the core of a transformer. It's normally a laminated core that's covered in copper winding with multiple turns. And these are put in series at the input of low voltage VSDs to dampen the voltage peaks. And as a natural consequence, they also dampen the uh, uh, distortion, the distorted current. 
wave forms. So if yeah, you remember yeah, back, let yeah, me try and demonstrate yeah, how that worked. I don't have that specific info in this presentation, but what? But let me show you how it works, basically. I'm going to take you all the way back to the to those current waveforms that were distorted right in the beginning. Um, Kirk? Yes. Um, essentially, um, yeah. it's a um, inductive filter. Correct. Correct. Uh, but I'll just remember, I just want to get back to that slide that would actually show this nicely. Here we go. This one. Okay. Remember, we said that in the normal circumstance, the load, the, the output, the load on the output of the drive, has an effect on the distortion of the current. So the, the the small bunny ears on the inside is in a low load condition, and it's very distorted. That and they are discontinuous bunny ears. At the top, we have a higher load situation, and we have a conti more continuous waveform. It's still distorted, but it looks a lot better. We do the same principle using an inductor or a reactor, whatever you want to call it, on the input of a low voltage drive to improve. So remember, it resists instantaneous changes in the energy. So we basically make what would have been a discontinuous, highly distorted current. We create it now to be a, a, a continuous, less distorted current waveform just by adding that impedance um, at the input of the drive. Um, no, thanks for that, Kirk. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get my... Uh, okay, that's clear. Then, uh, Unusen Governor um, is asking, when comparing MVVSDs and slip energy recovery drives, what are the major drawbacks to using a ACR? Okay, so on, on large slippering machines, any slippering machine that's larger than say three megawatt, the slip energy recovery is a medium voltage drive because your rotor voltage is often, if you've got a three megawatt slippering motor, for example, your rotor voltage will almost definitely exceed a thousand volts as soon as you exceed a thousand volts you cannot use low voltage power electronics you have to step up to medium voltage power electronics or do some fancy footwork like we do on h cell topologies they, they don't do that on SCRs. what they use are thyristors on slip energy recovery systems connected to the rotor of the machine and they switch to put that slip energy back back to the system um, and so you essentially use that slip energy recovery drive which as i've said in most cases is a medium voltage drive um back back to the back to the system if you compare so, so commercially speaking the comparison is relatively similar between putting in an mv drive that controls the stator and rotor of the machine and, and controls it completely. I'm talking about it is able to manipulate that motor from zero RPM to 100% speed, even go over speed. You're not limited to the speed range. You're not limited in the control of, the, of that motor. You do not need to have a slippery motor. You can use a squirrel cage machine. Plus that VSD protects the entire system from the primary input terminals of that VSD right down to the motor terminals. So it is a, a, a literally you install the device and it takes care of the system. For a similar commercial value of a slip energy recovery drive, which only connects to the rotor, does not protect the motor as a complete system, cannot vary the speed up and down by more than 10% down and 10% above nominal speed. Um, also, the, the technology has evolved in the medium voltage drive field 
a lot more rapidly than it has in the SER field. And so you're finding a reliability improvement actually compared if you compare one to the other. So I'm not throwing them out altogether. They definitely have their place, but I'm just trying to do a comparison between an MV drive that's supplying the, the complete system versus a slip energy recovery that is only recovering energy from the rotor of a slipping motor. I've, I've seen many slip energy recovery systems working for two months and, sit and, and literally being bypassed and never used again because of the, the limited local expertise available on them. Okay. So, Emerson, I, I believe that uh, answers your question just uh, satisfactorily. Um, uh, look, I'm not seeing many more um, questions. Uh, it's quite a few compliments. So, again, thanks for doing an excellent job. Um, I just want to quickly pass over to Joe. He'd like to say something. Uh, hello, Theo. Yes, um, thanks for 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 any over to me. So, on on behalf of uh, Zestweg, um, I'd like to thank you, Theo, for providing the uh, the uh, the schedule um, to enable us to do the two technical presentations. Um, Minx to SAI. EE, uh, thank you for the platform for enabling us to to actually present. And uh, to my colleague Kirk, um, thanks for sharing your vast knowledge and to make it simple to understand. I mean, even I understood some of it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> lastly to to uh, to all the attendees, um, I hope that you guys took a lot um, away from it. And just looking at some of the comments on the uh, on the uh, on the question sheet. Um, there, there's uh, a couple of people that are that have commented in terms of future sessions. So yeah, just um, just look out for them. We will be scheduling uh, some for next year, but uh, again, it will be via um, SAIWE and obviously Theo. So um, Theo, that's me done. Back to you. Uh -huh. Thanks a lot, Joe. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Kirk, Minx, everyone involved. Um, the effort. Um, just also like to say that uh, to all the attendees, thank you very much for taking some time out of your busy schedules to, to, to uh, broaden your knowledge base. Um, please also um, visit the SIE website um, to get a schedule of the upcoming webinars at uh, SIE.org.za. Um, and then you guys should by tomorrow receive your. Um, Certificate of attendance to claim your EXA points. With that, uh, thank you very much, guys, and uh, till the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, and goodbye.